This is Greg Collins, Substitute Teacher's Lounge. Guys, I have found out how important it is for even the substitute to know about Google Classroom. And I got to see some of my kids this week. Don't worry, we were more than six feet apart. Oh, it was another week of substitute teacher training. I've got so much stuff to talk about. If you all let me talk about everything that happened to me this week, it would be a long podcast. So we'll try to keep it organized. I did want to mention right off the bat, though, that I did listen to a podcast from my podcast publisher, Buzzsprout, this week, because everybody is always so curious about how many people are listening to their podcast. Well, given the numbers that they provide to me, they told us this week that if you get this many listens, you're at this percentage of the podcast. So I'm pleased to say that you guys have already made Substitute Teachers Lounge podcast in the top 10% of all the podcasts that they publish. In fact, I could be in the top 5% if we grow about 10 to 15% more. So tell all your friends and your fellow teachers and substitute teachers to listen to this podcast. I still would like to get you guys more involved, especially now that we're going back to school. So whether virtually or, or in person. So be thinking about that. So getting in the top 5% is attainable. A little bit higher than that, it, it's amazing how much more listens you have to just to grow one more per- percent beyond the top five. It's it's basically thousands and thousands, so it's crazy. But right now, we are in the top 10% of all podcasts that Buzzsprout publishes, and we're just a you know, an attainable step away from getting in the top 5%. So thank you guys for all of that. So as much as I have learned these last two weeks as I prepare for the virtual classes to begin here in three working days, it's been enjoyable the whole time. It's been intense, but yet at the same time, I've enjoyed every minute of it. I can't, couldn't wait to get back each morning to get into new things. I'll tell you a little bit about the technology class. I love math, and I've got basically three classes of math and I've got two technology classes and I'm going to tell you what I'm teaching for technology because the technology part they're they're letting me use you know I'm, I get it all approved through the administration of course but they're letting me use my idea so it's more of a related arts class maybe the students that wouldn't otherwise be taking band or music or something along those lines they're signing up for this. I think they're actually calling the class computer application. So I'll talk about that here in just a moment. I did want you to know, though, how important I have decided that Google Classroom is even for the substitute teacher to know about. And as I have studied it and gotten, you know, close to it and understand it so much better than I did two weeks ago, that. It's, it's really, it's come to my attention that I really wish that I had known more about it when I was substituting these last two years. Let me tell you how valuable it is. You know about the cloud. If you've never been in Google, you'd be, you know, hibernating. If you hadn't heard of the cloud, basically the cloud is just a way in general that things can be stored and allow you to work on something in different locations with different devices. Well, that's why that works so well for kids and Google Classroom, especially now that we're starting virtually because we can post all the lessons on there. But the teachers can even designate co-teachers. So I've got a suggestion for you, especially if you have a teacher that likes to have you substitute quite a bit why don't you ask them if they, if you can be set up as a co-teacher? Now, what that will allow you to do is to see everything that that teacher posts 
whenever that teacher posts it. That means then, instead of you going in cold to substitute teach one morning, maybe the teacher said, oh, you'll have, a, you'll have an easy day because all their assignments are on Google Classroom. Ask them to be a co-teacher, and then you can look at those assignments the night before and kind of be prepared. Every time that one of the students would ask me to help when they had a Google Classroom assignment, I first had to kind of familiarize myself with what their topic was, what their question was, maybe even it's some things. You know, I, I learned all this, but vocabulary has changed since the 70s, and I want to make sure I know what they're being asked. So it's just kind of nice to have know what's going to go on the next day. In fact, one thing as a side note that I learned this week of something I shouldn't be doing the last two years I ready, a lot of you know this already, is a diagnostic tool, and it helps the students to figure out and helps the teacher to figure out at what level they are. So if the student answers questions more consistently, well, they'll be taken to a different level and be challenged with different questions. So it's so important, I found out, that parents not help the students on iReady because that just artificially allows them to pass the questions they may not otherwise pass. So all of a sudden, now they're getting difficult questions, and when they get into the classroom and are working on iReady, they may be lost. So it's a way of using the tool to diagnostically look at that student, see where they are. It's There's nothing wrong with just being average. That's kind of what we want to be average in certain spots so that the teacher knows how to increase the student's knowledge and where to go. So I learned that with that this week, and this is why I mentioned that. I know when I have substitute taught in the past, students would be working on already, and they would ask me for help. And since I was not yet that familiar, I, I knew what already was, but I didn't really realize what it was used for. It just looked like another set of problems for me. So that was definitely a learning tool. So as we enter into classes virtually, we have to really emphasize with our parents not to allow, you know, not to help their students. This is just to you know, for lack of a better phrase, diagnose them, diagnostically look at them and determine where we need to go so that we can all learn things and not be lost as we grow together. So I am blessed to have as both a teacher mentor and a friend because I also see her in a coaching capacity from time to time. She has been so helpful with me. At the same time, she is responsible for what I teach those kids. So it then means that the sixth and seventh grade classes that I'm teaching in math, I need to work very closely with those teachers. In fact, what we're going to do as we start virtually, those teachers have already prepared what they want their students to learn. And in fact, they've got calendars for, if not through December, for the entire year on where we need to be best based on the standards that are set up for that age group. So it helps me to just work right off of what they published. I'm going to teach my classes the exact same curriculum that they've set up. And in fact, it'll be great for me these next three weeks, even though we went into it kicking and dragging because we want it to start right away. We have three weeks of virtual classes in Kentucky in our district. And the teachers that I've talked to, we have decided to, since we're going to be doing this through Zoom meetings, we're going to be publishing the Zoom link to both sets of students, my first period, the other teacher's first period, as an example. And then we are going to at least initially work from the same classroom. All the students, or basically two students' worth of classes, will be logging in to the same Zoom meeting. So in effect, we'll have, you know, over 30 students in on this one meeting. We'll be learning together, and we'll 
you know, there's going to be a learning curve. So, some of them may not have used Zoom as often. So we've got that to deal with. We have tested the process. We think we have a pretty good system in place. But the teachers and I have decided that it might be good for the, the students to see us teaching in a united way rather than me just sitting in my classroom on the same meeting and be another block on there. We're going to start by letting the students see us in the classroom together, teaching together, sharing ideas together, helping each other, helping them to learn as much as we can. So that's how we're going to start our virtual classes. Now, one thing that I'll have to deal with is the technology related arts class that they have me teaching in two seventh grade periods. And I have really worked a lot on this that this week because I've decided where and I run this by the administration I've decided several things that I want them to do and if you rack your brain you might be able to figure out one of them okay I'm going to teach them how to podcast we're going to go through an audacity tutorial that I'll teach I also reference a Pat Flynn tutorial about using Audacity that I like really well and taught me a lot when I was first starting. We're also going to be talking about how to use Kindle publishing to publish a book. Those students could actually publish a book for free. So there's so many resources out there that they can use now. So I'm going to be doing that. I am also a very nostalgic guy. I've already posted a picture of myself holding an Atari 2600, which back in the day was called the Atari Video Computer System or VCS when it first came out. So I think it's kind of cool to both see me in the year that happened holding that Atari in my lap on Christmas Day. And we're going to go through kind of the history of Atari or not necessarily Atari, but the history of video games, the history of computing. I think you guys know as well as I do that the computers that they used to land a man on the moon, your iPhone that you're holding in your hand has more computing power than those computers did. So it's changed so much. So that's thing. That's one thing we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about taking ideas from their head and writing about them to maybe create that Kindle publishing book. Or one of the great suggestions I heard from one of the teachers was I might get with their ELA teacher and see if they have any kind of writing project, not a project based on another author's work, of course, because we couldn't publish that. But if they're writing something about their life, they can turn that into a Kindle publishing situation and publish a book, even if it doesn't take off. I bet they'll sell a few copies to their relatives. So that is so cool that they can do that and that Kindle Publishing allows you to do that. And you know, I recently published the book, Substitute Teachers Lounge, that has a lot of good ideas in it that we've learned from the podcast. So I can't wait to teach those kids that lesson. I am also came across, we're, we're big on Khan Academy, that is K-H-A-N academy.com. There's so many great ideas. I just searched for middle school technology, and I came across computer coding. And they even, I wondered if that was going to be over my seventh graders' heads, but Khan Academy recommended it for that grade level. I ran it by my uh, sons, who are in their 30s now, but have had a little experience with it. They seem to like it, and I'm going to start out that way. You know, the very first lesson is just using computer coding to create an object. And then as the lessons progress, they add more and more to that coding to add color and all that type of thing. I think it's going to be fascinating for them. And then as we move along through the year, we're going to we'll get into web design. But I also want to do the retro part to just let them know how computing has has changed over the years, and all these kids were born in the 2000s, so they're used to always having a smartphone and all that kind of thing. So I want to take a look back and show them what's happened in the past. So 
that's what we'll do. I'm excited for that. You know, it's funny, just so that you kind of know what we're doing. If you go to any web page and right click on it anywhere and click view page source, that will show you all the coding that had to be done for that page to even exist. So it's pretty amazing when you see what all goes into that. So that's that's one of the things that we're going to be doing in that technology class. Now, given our Google Classroom discussion, I want to take that a little bit further than what I told you because, for instance, since I'm sharing resources with the other teacher, or let's be honest, they, they're, they're doing all the curriculum work and I'm teaching off of their curriculum. So, And, and they're absolutely great. I, I couldn't have had two better teachers to do that from. Basically, what they'll do, since they've set me up as a co-teacher in Google Classroom, then everything that they publish on their Google Classroom page, I will get an email that they just published something. I'll see what they published. I can open that if I want to publish it to mine without changing anything. I can do that. If then, if I use their exact source then anytime they make a change or they find something to change on it, it will automatically update mine as well. So that is really nice. And and it's behind the scenes. I might even pick up on it. I was looking at something this week that the teachers and I got together and we we changed something together. So that was kind of cool to have another couple of eyes to, to look at that type of thing. Other things that my co-teacher, or I'm the co-teacher really, the teacher would put in their Google Classroom, I might choose to make a copy of it. A lot of it has to do with the virtual classroom and using our bitmojis to kind of you know, loosen things up for the students. For instance, a, a uh, virtual classroom that one teacher published in their Google Classroom for a certain class. I got my email that they had published that. I opened it. Well, the first page of the slides was this teacher's Bitmoji, pictures of her and her spouse on the wall, and picture of her dogs. So, well, if I just copied that, that would be pretty tacky. So I not only just changed her Bitmoji and just changed the pictures, I also changed quite a bit about it because I'm an official. I put a volleyball and a softball on the floor. All of this is clip art style things and Bitmoji style things. So it kept it really loose and fun for the kids to watch. I tried to come up with some clever, although I'm sure the students will tell you they're corny sayings on my sheet. And then sometimes it's not that I didn't love the way the teacher worded something, sometimes I would just word it in ways more along the lines of how I talk. So I would get the same concept, but reword things. But it was so nice to see everything that the teacher published. I could then publish it exactly. And if that teacher changes anything, my copy will change. If I want to just use hers as a template, I can do that. Now, to do that, I make a copy of it. And of course, then, if that teacher changes something, my copy would not change. So I do have to keep that in mind and make sure that everything is up to date. But man, this Google Classroom is great. I would encourage, again, substitutes. Even if you don't feel like your teacher is going to set you up as a co-teacher, get into that. Look at what you can do for it. I would encourage you to do this. Go to slides.google.com. In fact, if you want to YouTube search first, create slides for classroom using Google, something along those lines, do that first. Get some ideas. And then it's so easy to drag your Bitmoji into the picture. You can type the word happy in the Bitmoji window and it will 
bring back the version of your Bitmoji that shows that you're happy. If you're learning, I had one that had like a computer loading over a bar that like the computer was loading above my head like I was thinking. There was one with a light bulb over it. You can pick any topic, even sports. I've got one of the slides that I'm using that I just put myself serving a volleyball. So, man, it's so enjoyable. Get into Google Classroom, play around with it. But you can go to slides.google.com. You can go to docs.google.com. Now, I grew up on the Microsoft package, Excel and Word and all that. Docs has its own version. They are very much compatible with each other. So one can be saved as the other. So it's very useful. I am going to start using all the Google suite of things exclusively so that I, I can learn and be prepared for that as a teacher. Now, I'm going to have this position for the year, but it'll be over after the year, and I'll probably, depending on what happens in my life, I'll probably go back to the day-by-day substitute teaching after that. And I can tell you right now, I am going to stay up to date on Google Classroom. So I would encourage you to get in there and do that because it's awesome. And of course, one of the things that we can publish is all the classroom assignments. I've actually already posted an assignment, and I'm going to give you, I think I've mentioned this in a previous podcast episode, but I I put the problem in there about them looking at a diagram of an airplane that had been shot with bullets in World War II, and their job was to find out which part of the airplane they should reinforce. There's the engine, there's the wings, and there's the tail. And they only have enough money. They got to repair the whole thing, of course, but they only have enough money to extra reinforce one section, either the engine or the wings or the tail. And the problem is there are almost no bullet holes in the engine. There's a lot of bullet holes in the wings And a lot, but not quite as much in the tail. So their problem was to decide which section should get the extra reinforcement and why. So that was my first assignment. They're just going to get credit for it by answering anything as long as they justify it in their explanation. And I can't remember if I told it to you guys in that detail, but work on that this week. That's your assignment this week. I will give you the answer next week. And I will tell you the same hint that I gave them that this is a true story and what the repair people were getting ready to do, they changed their mind on after a mathematician just happened to walk into the hangar and mention something to them. So keep all that in mind. See what you think. Man, there is so many things I could talk about, and I know I've left some things out that I wanted to tell you guys, but I'm so excited this week on several during the day and also into the evening if we had classes in that age group. We did not allow any students or parents to come into the building. We didn't think that was a safe thing to do. So what we did, we took shifts. We all put our mask on, and we had curb service. We went outside, and parents would come by during certain time periods, a lot most of the time with their students, not always, but most of the time with their students. So they got the forms they needed to complete. They got all their Google Classroom codes that their student would need to type in to get into their classroom and their assignment. And they got their schedule, their educational schedule. So I like to go ahead and bond with the students even from six feet away because I would glance at their schedule before they got it, see if I was one of their teachers, and then, you know, talk to them about that and, and you know, kind of joke around with them already, loosen them up, make them excited for class. If you're helping doing that as a substitute teacher, too, obviously you can do the same thing. You could say, I'll be helping teaching with this class. I'll see you a lot at this school. There's all kinds of things you can do. So, guys, it was a super exciting week. 
I feel like I'm just getting started telling you things, and we're already almost out of time. So I hope you're getting a lot of a lot of substitute jobs. What I found out, I canceled my sub alert app because I'm not going to need it this week or you know during this year. But what I didn't realize is that I had renewed it for the whole year to save some money, even though I won't need it. So I still see all the absences are, that are being posted in our area, and they're still coming up quite a bit. So make sure you get one of those apps, SubAlert or Jobulator. Decide which one is alerts you more quickly in your area, and make sure you do that because that's going to mean a lot to you. And I can tell it's going to be a at least in my district, I can't imagine it being different in yours. It's going to be a big substitute teacher year. And obviously, we want everybody to stay healthy. Sports are going to be starting soon. I already have volleyball matches to officiate here in just a few weeks. And we have got enormous health regard changes into the rules. So, I hope you've enjoyed this week. I wish I could have told you more. I'll have more to tell you next week. So I will see you then on Substitute Teacher's Lounge. Music provided by Ben Sounds.